Welcome to Fireside Gaming. I'm Billum, and I've got an interesting question for you this time around. Have you ever just wanted to go back and play a game that you never got to beat? A game that you built up in your mind as probably being really fun, but you just for some reason never got to play it all the way through, or even much at all. For me, Croc Legend of the Gobos is one of those games. I originally bought Croc back in middle school at a Scholastic Book Fair. Yeah, my parents sent me to a school book fair to buy books, and then I went and bought a PC game. Granted, this wasn't all that uncommon. Don't get me wrong, I typically bought books, and I was and still am an avid reader. But I bought a lot of games at Scholastic Book Fairs simply because I was given money and I wasn't supervised. Just a few that I can remember off the top of my head are Sim Earth, Sim Theme Park, the 3D remakes of Centipede and Frogger, and of course, Croc. And while all of those other games never gave me trouble, my poor old PC just couldn't handle Croc. At this time, I think my family was still using this old Windows 98 Packard Bell that we had, and the game was just downright unplayable as in single digit frame rates. And I want to be incredibly clear here that this isn't the game's fault. I was just a kid and had no idea what computer specs even were and hadn't once heard of a graphics card in my life. So Croc just kind of sat around in the back of my mind as this game that seemed really fun, but not one I ever really played. That is until I picked up a copy during a game collecting spree earlier this year. I only spent 15 bucks on a copy that I'm almost positive was opened but never played. Just to put to rest this curiosity that's been sitting in the back of my head for about 20 years now. Now don't get me wrong, this wasn't something that was eating at me all my life. Think of it more as a small tingle that would pop up when I saw the game in retro shops, but wasn't enough to get me to buy it until earlier this year. And considering my lack of croc knowledge, I was surprised to find out that he originally started out as a pitch for a Yoshi game. Evidently Argonaut Games were pretty happy about their relationship with Nintendo after their collaboration on the SNES. So happy, in fact, that they tried to get Nintendo to let them make a Yoshi game. And when Nintendo rejected the idea, Argonaut switched gears and retooled Croc into its own IP. But the real question here is, was it worth it? Both them making this game and me buying it. And that's what we're going to get into now. Croc is incredibly light on story, but I am still going to warn that there are spoilers in this video. The basic rundown of Croc's story is that he's an orphan discovered by the Gobos, a tribe of small, brown, furry balls that immediately make me think of Karibo from Yu-Gi-Oh. These peaceful little fellows raise Croc, and all is well until Baron Dante comes along and captures all of the critters. This has Croc teaming up with companion Boney the Bird to save all of the Gobos and defeat the evil wizard. And that's exactly what we do. After running around through four worlds, they finally face down against the Baron with Croc dealing him a crushing defeat. And with that, the Gobos are saved and all is right with the world again. Unless you want to 100% the game and take on a secret world with another showdown against Dante. For the record, I didn't do this. And while I know I could have just used the game's password system to skip to that final fight and get some footage of it, that felt like cheating, so I didn't. And I guess that means that now is the time to talk about the gameplay in Croc Legend of the Gobos, since it's what kept me from caring about getting the true ending and fighting the real final version of Dante. My biggest problem with Croc is no doubt its controls and that's despite the fact that it gives players a few different options to work with. The game starts players off with basic tank controls, albeit with a few oddities, such as the left and right arrow keys only turning Croc in those directions while on the ground. If the player jumps, then suddenly that switches to automatically moving left or right in air, which was a bit odd for me, but it was an easy enough thing to adjust to. However, Croc also features analog controls, sort of. It's hard to explain exactly how it works, but trying to move Croc with this analog setup is a pain. It takes simple tasks like turning around and morphs them into an Olympic sport of frantic jumping to try and avoid certain death. I actually disliked this control scheme so much that I switched back to the tank controls as I felt they complemented the game's level design better. Truth be told, I have no problem with tank controls themselves. Some of my favorite games, such as Armored Core, Animusha, and Resident Evil all rely off of them. But something about the level design and obstacles in Croc makes me long for a more traditional analog control scheme. This isn't to say that Croc is filled to the brim with blisteringly hard levels or anything like that. In fact, I only ran into two throughout the entire game that gave me any real problem. The first of these was World 4-1, Tower of Power. It went on way too long for what it was, and the constant jumping over death pits, missing those jumps, running out of lives, and starting the level over left me incredibly frustrated. Even so, I did finally beat it, only to run into panic at Platform Pete's lair just a few levels later. This is the final level before the battle against Baron Dante, and let me tell you something. 
This level was a nightmare. It starts easy enough by showing players the gimmick of platforms flipping into spike blocks to go with the hammer slams of this blue robed dude who I can only assume is Platform Pete. And then it immediately ramps up into having to make a series of jumps in a limited amount of time, runways that spin all at once and love to throw the player off, and a full-on long platforming section that requires the player to ride around on moving blocks across a couple of different rooms before they reach the end. I'm usually pretty good at controlling my temper, but there was a lot of rage in my soul until I beat this level. If you want to make getting through some of these levels easier on yourself, it's always best to go back and harvest lives. There are a few different places that you can find, including Tower of Power if you're late game, where you can just collect some hearts at the very beginning, exit the level, and you get to keep those hearts. I ended up doing this for Platform Pete's and I got to about 13 or 14 lives I think to make it through the level easier and then I proceeded to play through it and only lose one life, because that's how things go sometimes. Yet again, the tank controls are the biggest obstacle players will have to deal with in Croc, and that's unfortunate since I feel like this game has a lot of potential. I legitimately like a lot about Croc's setting and appearance. Don't get me wrong, it's simple, but still good. Crocs and Gobos both have designs that reek of successful mascot platformer, and the game's bright and colorful worlds are a plus. I also really dig all of Croc's cute little sayings when he's attacking enemies like Curse Plat and Yazoo, and the sound effects and music both follow along with this by being fitting for the setting and enjoyable to hear. I even went so far as to check out the Game Boy Color version of Croc 1 hoping that its formula may work better in a 2D setting. And while what I played of the game was inoffensive, it in no way shape or form convinced me to stick around past the first level. To be fair though, that's partially because I can't stand 2D platformers that automatically shift the camera around to whatever direction the character is facing. I get the logic of it giving the player a better view of what's coming in front of them, but it messes with my eyes something fierce and I just can't handle it. Funnily enough, there was another major problem on the Game Boy Color version of Croc that is present in the main game as well. Poor player feedback. Specifically, there's not really much of anything to let players know when they've hit an enemy. That's doubly true for bosses, with there not being any kind of sound effects or any iota of physical feedback on screen to show that they've been hit. And it also doesn't help that the hitboxes in Croc are kinda wonky. This actually makes just about all of the boss fights a little annoying, as it's hard to gauge just how close Croc does have to get to them to hit them. Then there's that lack of satisfaction that comes from a silent tail swing that maybe damaged the boss. It makes all of these boss fights feel incredibly anticlimactic, especially during the final battle with Bear and Dante. So to summarize, Croc has a kid-friendly story, cute and lovable characters, a fun soundtrack, and good vocals to go with it, but it's pulled down by its frustrating controls and level design, as well as its lack of feedback for physical attacks. All of this is to say is that Croc is a flawed game that I think could have been really good, but just doesn't stick the landing. It's really only okay at best in my book. But hey, maybe the game can still be redeemed. This is incredibly recent news, but Jez San, the founder of Argonaut, sent out a tweet saying that Croc HD is in the works. The game is evidently in early development right now, and I'm hoping all goes well with it. Maybe we can get some true analog controls this time around to go with that fresh coat of paint. If so, this series is one that I would be willing to return to, but for now, I'm gonna skip out on covering any more Croc games. Thanks for checking out my review of Croc Legend of the Gobos, and until next time, take it easy.